Welcome to Lifetime Talks. I'm Jamie Martin. And I'm David Freeman. And in this episode, we are talking about inflammation. This is a topic that is one of the most requested topics that we have gotten since we started the podcast. People are really interested in what it is, how it affects our health, why it's essential, but also when it becomes too much. So with that in mind, we are really excited to have Dr. Greg Plotnikoff with us today. Dr. Plotnikoff is a board certified internist and pediatrician who has received national and international honors for his work in cross-cultural and integrative medicine. He's the founder and medical director of Minnesota Personalized Medicine, and he and his team serve people who have suffered from complex, chronic, and mysterious illnesses. Dr. Plotnikoff is a graduate of Carleton College, Harvard Divinity School, and the University of Minnesota Medical School. He's the recip recipient of several international awards for research and teaching, as well as the Early Career Distinguished Achievement Award from the University of Minnesota Medical School. And there's more. Mm -hmm. He is the author or co-author of more than 60 articles in the peer-reviewed medical literature, dozens of medical textbook chapters, and the celebrated book, Trust Your Gut, Heal from IBS and Other Chronic Stomach Problems Without Drugs. Dr. Plotnikoff, or Greg, consciously chose to attend divinity school before medical school to deepen his understanding of suffering and of human responses to suffering. After eight years of medical school and residency training, he helped establish the Center for Spirituality and Healing at the mm. University of Minnesota, where he served at its, as its first medical director. And there's more. Mm. We're going to link to that all online. So you know we're going to mm. talk a little bit about your experience in Tokyo when we okay. get going here. So yeah. cool. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, to, to kick <laughs> off with, uh, obviously, a lot of the credentials, the experiences, what's out to me there and, and Jamie kind of alluded to it that this is the most requested topic inflammation and and knowing that you have a lot of experience in this space there's there's a lot of things that we want to get right into right now as far as the various forms of inflammation that we see out there and we have the acute the chronic the localized the systemic so I, I just want to hear from you as far as in this space around inflammation how do these come things come about well classic understanding of inflammation is what we can see what's mm. visible, what we can feel. And we talk about swelling and redness and pain and warmth and maybe disruption in function. That's kind of classic acute or, uh, things. So we think of sprained ankle, you know, right. infected cut, things of that sort. And, and that inflammation we consider good, positive inflammation. That's part of the healing response. Mm -hmm. right. It's the invisible inflammation and uh, the chronic inflammation, um, the systemic inflammation that has actually captured a lot of attention. And I think that's where everyone really is, is interested in things. Um, what it, because it's been tied with so many of chronic illnesses that we'd all like to avoid. Yeah. The diabetes, the heart disease, the cancer, the uh, Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera. So to stay as young and healthy as possible, no matter what age we are, right. is means some attentiveness to things which could drive inflammation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So before we started recording, you actually shared a little bit of a story. I'd love if you'd be willing to share about an experience you had in Tokyo, when kind of an yeah. introduction to different <coughs> approaches to this. Yes, well, I was a visiting professor of medicine at Keio University Medical School in Tokyo. And, um, and so I had one of these aha moments one yep. day. So I'm standing in the hospital and in a small group um, of physicians who are talking about a case. And this patient has very clearly has a fever, which in the United States is just kind of, you don't even think about it. You just give people acetaminophen. Mm -hmm. But no one was talking about that. I'm just like, it's not on the action plan. So, um, I, so I asked the question, oh, why not to give acetaminophen? And uh, people just kind of look at each other and just kind of look down, and no one's making eye contact and no one's responding. I'm just kind of, maybe I'm not translating correctly. Maybe they use paracetamol. Um, uh, and so I translate that into Japanese, and people then really start looking down. And finally, the chief physician turns to me straight in the eye. He goes, Greg san, why would you ever suppress the body's natural healing response? Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 well, I've been trained since day one. We give acetaminophen for, for everything, for breakfast, mm -hmm. you know, anything. Yep. And you wouldn't ever let a patient ever have a fever. Um, right. You just load them up with acetaminophen. Yep. And I realized, wow, I hadn't even ever thought about that. But that is kind of our 
predisposition. We are into suppressing, squashing, you know, kind of um, making everything the same. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, rather than working on the body's natural healing response. So, so for inflammation, we have all these fabulous expensive drugs, uh, tumor necrosis factor, and uh, things where we can suppress things. We, can, we use prednisone a lot to literally squash and suppress inflammation. Mm -hmm. And the new shift, and this is where self-care comes in, is actually able to facilitate the body's capacity to actually roll back inflammation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So something come happens. You know, it's like we, we get a, a cut or we sprain an ankle or something like that, and signals goes out. the signal goes out to the, hey, immune system, we need some help over here. You know, and so things rush in, activated, roll out the body's natural healing response, and sometimes they get stuck. Right. Hey, we've been at this for a while. Where's the off switch? Uh, can't find it. Okay, keep going. And that's when we would uh, be tempted then to uh, squash it with prednisone or, yeah. gosh, it's been going on and it's destroying the joint. Let's give an uh, anti-tumor growth effector alpha agent and things of that sort, yep. uh, things that we all hear about on TV ads, rather than how about rolling mm. things back, how about down-regulating things, um, and that's the exciting new things because <gasps> it's in our power as human beings to do just that. Exactly. Well, I think, you know, we know that, and you've already said this, inflammation is a, bio, a necessary biological reaction for yes. healing, for maintaining health and all of those pieces, but yet too much can lead to other health issues, which you've already mentioned. So what are some of the reasons or causes that inflammation has become too much of a good thing? Like, when does that balance tip? Like, ooh, that's, it's staying stuck on. And why? Are there environmental factors or what are the, the things that are causing that more frequently, it seems, or more commonly? Yes. Well, this is such a profound question. Mm -hmm. And so I will try to make a, a, a reasonable answer for it. But know that there's a lot of interest in this area. Yep. So, for example, why has inflammatory bowel disease kind of like skyrocketed in, in recent years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm is this kind of what is going on? Well, we know that there's a lot of things in our processed foods. There's a uh, glyphosate is everywhere. There's, uh, um, mm -hmm. we're using antibiotics like, like acetaminophen. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For yes. breakfast. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, you know, this kind of, um, uh, and so there's disruption to that, the chemicals that we uh, uh, come across. So. A patient we were talking about uh, before this broadcast I uh, saw this morning, we did a special uh, special uh, toxin profile on them, um, looking actually we able to do probes into the mitochondria to measure. And it's like there's mold toxins and heavy metals and, and phthalates and triclosane, so antibiotics and lindane. Uh, and it's just like, whoa, we carry a lot of stuff with us. Yes. So, uh, so inflammation is in some part due to the fact that we have a lot of environmental stress around us. But then add physical stress. Mm -hmm. Some of it is good. So when you, when you're in your GTX program, for example, mm -hmm. it's just like, yeah, we are creating an inflammatory state, but it's a healthy inflammatory state. Right. And it's going to actually boost the body uh, right. rather than deplete the body. Um, and but take that too much further. So people, I ran to someone the other day who did a 90-kilometer run over like two days or three days, and just like some of these people we see prematurely age. Yeah. You know, and so premature aging physically in, in mm -hmm. one's face, uh, it can be a reflection of they're just overwhelming the body, you know, in, mm -hmm. in doing things in kind of some of the uber um, uh, things. Then there's also the emotional components yeah. of the emotional stressors we all carry with us but you know anything from anger to the most toxic of all human emotions resentment mm. wow. you know carry uh, that that then feeds into kind of physical stressors like impaired sleep which then feeds into kind of environmental stressors of kind of like creating an environment where you're even angrier <laughs> right <laughs> it's um, a cycle right it, it just it feeds itself it seems yes, like yes then you add you know pharmaceutical stressors add um, dietary stressors and all of a sudden oh we've got a lot mm. of factors that can be playing a role in this 
The greatest of them are, of course, those that are going to lead to things like atherosclerosis or, or um, impaired uh, gastrointestinal functioning or um, uh, drivers of migraines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these uh, these um, are all opportunities. Mm. Symptoms are opportunities for us to kind of deepen awareness and recognize, okay, we have a concern here, and it can be addressed. Mm. Wow. I like that. Mm-hmm. Opportunities. Mm-hmm. Let's, 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 let's tackle that. So we now know what can cause, you know, chronic inflammation and, and what can we do about it? Because we know there there's good news in this space mm-hmm. of opportunity um, and the power that we can affect within our lifestyle factors. So you described this under the umbrella of true primary care. Can you talk a little bit more about what this is and why it matters? Yeah, true primary care is what we do for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And somehow we forgot that. Yeah. And the worst term ever invented, the most insulting term, at least for per health professionals, is primary care provider. Mm. Primary care provider implies that we, we're not in the position to take care of ourselves. Right. And a provider implies some kind of transactional relationship where it's kind of one way. Mm-hmm. I like health professional where there's a profession of an oath and where there's a bidirectional relationship for yep. things. And that's where you know we have a health professional as thought partner in things uh, rather than dictator or general with right. a one-way uh, direction. But true primary care being what we do for ourselves, I think about the five fundamentals breathing, eating, sleeping, moving, as in exercising, and loving. That is, living a life of, of passion, purpose, and connection. Yep. And, and you know, if we think about life in those terms, we can self-assess, well, how am I doing on breathing? Mm, maybe at this moment, not so well, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. but um, how am I doing with eating? Mm-hmm. How am I doing with sleeping? How am I doing with moving? How am I doing with living a life of meaning and purpose and connection? Yeah. It goes back to, we talk about this all the time, like kind of the pillars that we frequently come back to in what we're doing. It's all of these things. And when you work on one, it can influence the other. And also when you're neglecting one, it can influence another. And so there's all Mm. these, they're intertwined and it's hard not to have them, to see them that way. Yes, and so that's why it doesn't matter where you start. Right. What's important is you start. Yes. And this has taken me 62 years to learn, and I'm still mm-hmm. teaching myself this, mm-hmm. but I share this with patients frequently. The secret is every day, intentional, deliberate, baby step in the right direction with a good dose of self-compassion. Mm. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk, I mean, mm. I mean, all of those pieces, I mean, that really comes down to, well, there's a mindset element there too, right? An awareness within yourself. When we're talking about what people can do, let's, I would love to dive into a little bit in terms of mm-hmm. from a nutrition standpoint and eating standpoint. You know, we talk about people's inflammatory loads, how we can dial things back. What are some proactive steps people can take on their own? But also, obviously, we know they want to work with a healthcare provider for more serious conditions. Well, actually, a healthcare professional. Professional. Ooh. Yes. I know. I, I, I knew yeah. it was going to happen. Lay up. Dunk. Okay. You got it. You're right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That was yes. good. Ooh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Professional. Professional. Okay. Professional. professional. Yeah. That is a thought yeah. partner yes. in these, these yes. things. And uh, where do you start? Well, sometimes because, you know, a good place to start is, well, we're often deciding what we're going to eat three times a day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so how so just even doing a self assessment without judgment okay how much of that is a whole food and how much of that is processed um you know, just kind of and i i love what actually the japanese government recommends they don't recommend a pyramid they don't recommend a plate they say aim for 30 different ingredients per day hmm. mm. And it's so much more constructive and because if you're getting 30 ingredients and they're not high fructose corn syrup and, you know, polysorbate X, Y, Z, but yeah. actually real ingredients, you're going to be doing really well. Right. And so people start realizing, oh, 
I had a four ingredient breakfast today. And it was kind of like, hmm. And uh, well, how can I up that? Well, let's say I add some blueberries and some, and a you know, multi grain granola, for example. Oh, I'm up to 10. Mm. Cool. Right. Oh, I didn't even think about that. So the idea about, you know, and then, oh, I took a baby step today. I added blueberries, pat on back. Yeah. Right. Good dopamine surge because you've completed a loop. You've you create you've made a step in a positive direction, and right. it inf- and, and it empowers you to move forward. In another step. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, starting with with diet is very easy, but maybe some people say, "Oh, I haven't slept well in years." Mm, okay. Well, let's talk about that. Right. Difficulty achieving sleep. Difficulty maintaining sleep. Both. You're waking up uh, between one and three in the morning. Between three and five in the morning. Uh, what's going on? I think I I love what the traditional East Asian medicine has to say about sleep. And waking between one and three in the morning is liver energy, so frustrations, angers, resentments mm. will waken one up between one and three in the morning. Oh, well, how do we address that? Well, are they pro-inflammatory? Absolutely. Is poor sleep pro-inflammatory? Absolutely. Hmm. Maybe we need to do some journaling. Maybe we need, you know, there's a variety of things for that. Between 3 and 5 in the morning is grief. Mm. It's a lung hour. Grief resides in the lungs. Oh. So I can't tell you uh, how many times I've asked uh, someone, oh, you're waking up uh, consistently around this time. This is a lung hour. Lung resides in the grief. Tell me. Does grief play any role in your life? And that's when tears just start to flow. And Mm -hmm. they said, no one's ever asked me about this. Mm -hmm. I said, absolutely, this is a health issue. Yep. And absolutely, there's no pill for it. Right. But I do tell people, I love this quote. I can't recall where I heard it. It's not original. But anything that has the power to bring tears is worth writing about, hmm. even writing for yourself. Yep. And so we think about inflammatory diseases like asthma and rheumatoid arthritis. Mm-hmm. There's a great study done about 25 years or so ago, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, got the editor in big trouble. <laughs> the study was this, it was people with severe asthma or severe rheumatoid arthritis. And severe was defined as on maximum medical therapy, and still symptomatic with quantifiable measures of disruption like uh, uh, impaired airflow and frequent ER visits. Mm -hmm. And the intervention was simply this, 30 minutes a day, pen to paper, writing, nonstop, only for oneself, stream of consciousness, no perfect verbs, no perfect sentences, no perfect paragraphs, just writing for oneself, oneself only, 30 minutes, one topic. Mm-hmm. Right. The, mo- the most stressful event of my life. The result in this population, a profound reduction in medications, significant improvement in all quantifiable measures, and near elimination of ER visits. Wow. So interesting. Yeah. It's and like just getting that out. Yep. Getting it out. Now, you know if that was a pill, mm-hmm. it'd be a zillion-dollar bestseller. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. But it's, it's self-care. And self-care, looking at a dimension that, mm, that uh, there is no need for a pill. In fact, a pill can be profoundly disempowering. <gasps> Mrs. Jones, the answer is in this pill. Right. 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 Well, that goes back to so much of the foundation of functional medicine is, you know, we want to help our bodies function optimally. We don't want to suppress or hide the root causes of these things, right? So how do we investigate those? And however you end up doing that, but I think it goes back to the roots of what we're talking about today. Yes. Well, one of my favorite um, athletic coaches is a guy by the name of Tim Galway. He had a great quote. He said, performance equals potential minus interference. Mm. Mm. And I said, oh, well, that refers to health. Optimal health equals potential minus interference. Mm -hmm. Mm. So what's the potential at any age? And what are these interfering factors? Mm -hmm. In most cases, the interfering factor is is not not enough pills. 
right. for prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, oh. And so what are those interfering factors? So being able to explore those and address those is part of our self-care. Right. But it means kind of using these different crucibles of challenges we have as opportunities to gain self-awareness. Right. The metaphorical vitamin A, awareness. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So when you think of our healthcare professionals, like right now, we, we have like maybe once or twice a year that we're going in to maybe do our annual or checkup or whatever it may be. Uh, being aware of all this information that we're empowering our listeners with, what are certain tests that we can ask our healthcare professionals? Yes, I would like to have this tested, kind of see where I'm at in these categories. Yes. Well, um, for inflammation, uh, uh, number one would be a high sensitivity C reactive protein. C yep. reactive protein, okay. Okay, and uh, that is a, a great measure of systemic inflammation. You don't want to see that high. Right. We want to see it uh, ideally, and they say normal is less than three. Ideally, you want to see it probably less than one. And um, what's the optimal? Would you say optimal? Optimal would be less than one. Less than one? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, now, it, it will also vary with, like, menstrual cycle. So ovulation, it will go up, um, for example. So, uh, so there's some nuances in interpreting it. Um, you wouldn't want to do it right after a vaccination. You wouldn't want to do it right after a cold and stuff like okay. that. Right. But, but in general, that is um, an inexpensive um, test to, to do. Right. Um, um, a test that's been around for 2,400 years or, or longer, as it's from the time of Hippocrates, um, wow. uh, it's called the sedimentation rate. It's literally just blood in a little capillary tube and just counting how many seconds it takes for it to settle. Um, and oh, that's a, a general measure of inflammation. There are other measures of inflammation people might be getting for other reasons, like a ferritin level is a great way of measuring iron but it's an acute phase reactant, which means that if there's inflammation, it will be falsely elevated. Mm. Um, so if you come across a high ferritin, oh, that's a concern. Copper is another one. If you come across a high copper, that's a concern. Now, every woman on an oral contraceptive has excessively high copper. So it's just known, but no one knows what to do with about, about it. Okay. Now, we know high copper is toxic uh, in the long run for people, but that's off topic, so, <laughs> we'll get to, so we won't go there. Um, but those are kind of the classic ones. Now, there, there are new ones which are emerging. Um, so a lot of people are measuring something called C4A. And C4A has been uh, associated with, um, oh, mold toxicity and other things. But it's actually a very nonspecific marker for inflammation. And normal levels are like around 2,800. The woman I saw this morning with a severe pain condition at level over 29,000. Mm. And it's just like, okay, something is going on, which is actually a relief for her because so many people with, in, with unless they have a broken leg or have an IV pole or something, uh, something like that, or hair is falling out, have right. invisible illness. Mm -hmm. And right. so measuring these things can give people relief. Oh, Thank God, an ab abnormal lab value. So there really is something going on. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, as right. opposed to, oh, you'll be fine. You know, it's just anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's just stress. Yeah. Right. But there yeah. is actually, you can measure it and say, yeah. like, now we can do something, too. I mean, you could yeah. do, there's things, obviously, in our day-to-day -day lives, but now there's yeah. support with your healthcare professional and partner. Yes. And so that's why I also strongly believe in a couple other blood tests. Uh, one is um, vitamin D level. Mm -hmm. and. And, uh, and there's strong pushback. I mean, people are, are pushing, you know, are trying to prevent people from getting vitamin D level. But I have to tell you, it's a huge issue in yeah. this country, vitamin D deficiency. And I don't understand why there's pushback from the medical profession against measuring it, especially in the time of COVID, especially in the time of RSV, which is yeah. a huge issue right now. But just look at the National Library of Medicine for RSV and vitamin D and we're shocked. Why aren't we out there getting everyone up to speed in vitamin D this winter? Mm. Right. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. It's cheap. It's inexpensive. The blood test itself, wholesale cost is about $20. Mm. Um, it's not a big deal. Right. Uh, so when you talk about vitamin D, because this is one thing, we've done an episode on this, and I would need to refresh my memory, but when we're looking at optimal levels of vitamin D, we were just talking about this yesterday with someone who was like, they said this was normal, but it was actually really low well, by functional well, so, medicine standards. Well, so the question is, what is normal? Right. Who is normal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are very political questions. 
and there are a lot of yeah. value judgments behind it. So normal can be a population bell curve right. and 95% of the middle, but that has nothing to do with physiological functioning. So what you really want is optimal functioning, right. and that's debatable. Now, the Endocrine Society is the most um, renowned organization on the planet, um, and the most uh, trustworthy for setting things, and they say minimum of 30 nanograms per ml, um, but they say, but evidence kind of suggests that maybe 40 to 60 would be optimal. Okay. Got it. So again, for a population, for an individual, it might be very different. And as we look at the genomics of vitamin D receptors and transporters and and you know, metabolizers, it's going to be we're going to get more detail on that. But but in general, those are are good places to to go. Mm-hmm. I want to just ask a quick question here about genetics and the role. Do your genetics, I mean, obviously we know there's epigenetics and genetics, right? Like, but do genetics predispose people to inflammation, some people, depending yes. on, okay. Yes, so when you think about the very important essential fatty acids, the omega-3s mm-hmm. and the omega-6s, there are two genes, FADS1 and FADS2, um, um, that, uh, that play a role in their transformation, and so, We have like flaxseed or chia seeds or hemp seeds or walnuts with short chain omega threes. To make them long chain, we have to go through fads one and fads two. The long chains are the ones that are biologically most active and most important and would represent, if I could add one blood test to every panel in the United States, it would be measuring the omega three, omega six panel. Mm. Um, The omega sixes, short chains come from Healthy sources are like safflower oil, sunflower oil, a bit in avocado oil, olive oil. Um, and those are short, but they have to be elongated um, right. for, uh, for a variety of reasons. And these all depend upon genomics. That's one, right. one easy to understand role. There's a lot of more difficult to understand roles. And the part of the problem is we think in single variables. Right. For example, when the three of us were in school, we were taught there's like one gene for eye color. We now know there's seven genes for eye color. Mm-hmm. And if we look at something complex like height, you know, we know now that it takes the contribution of over 700 genes to determine 80% of height. Wow. So what we're really talking about is very complex systems. So focusing on the epigenetics which is exactly what this is all about. Right, yeah. exactly, the yeah. lifestyle factors. The lifestyle yep. factors are, are, are most Im- important because yep. otherwise, at least at this point in world history, trying to figure out the contribution of 700 genes for something <laughs> is just, <laughs> we don't even have the supercomputers yet for that. Yeah. But it's old style thinking, you know, th- one gene, one problem. Right. And that's where, we, that's where we fell down this huge rabbit hole, which was unfortunate about like MTHFR, mm-hmm. just like, no, there are at least 16 genes in that in that pathway. One may be important, but you can over overemphasize that. Yeah. You just so. bring up MTHFR. It's like, oh, we should do a new story about that and do an update on that. It's been well, a while. Well, methylation so. is a very important thing. Over it is. 60 key genes for <laughs> mood, memory, energy, <laughs> sleep, and generalized oomph power Look are at. all dependent <laughs> upon methylation, Ooh. and it's easily assessed. Awesome. Ten dollar blood test. Wow. How about that? Wow. Awesome. So as we continue to progress and evolve as individuals in this space, um, I'm just thinking back to your craft. You, you said now at the at the tender age of 62 and, and still continuing to evolve in your craft, uh, what, what are certain things that you would say, okay, we now have all this information around inflammation. What's a, a go-to of like, hey, this, this is where I want you all to know right now listening. Uh, I like the part that you said as far as a true primary care, as far as starting with yourself, self-care, and gave a, a few different um, you know, resources as far as how to get back on track there. But I, I want to double down on uh, kind of what I, what I said earlier. For those individuals who are going in and getting um, their annual mm-hmm. and knowing what to ask for, and then also empowering them with the knowledge of, okay, these markers, and we can obviously link a lot of this information, we want optimal versus, mm-hmm. to your point, the subjectivity of uh, demographic and what it's based off of. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but w- we we should be looking for optimal, and then what mm-hmm. test should we be uh, asking for when we go to see our healthcare? Um, 
Yeah, so the healthcare professionals sometimes get their hands slapped if they order too much, mm. and so that's a, a problem. But if um, if you're working with a health professional who's willing to go out, or if you, or now some places offer capacity, you can order your own blood test and pay out of your own pocket. Okay, I think the omega three, omega six profile is really important. Okay, mm-hmm. um, and and the reason is because of the anti-inflammatory nature of these things. Now. Uh, so let me put a, a little bit of historical context. So in 1975, Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts, on behalf of the Nixon administration, made a major change in U.S. agricultural policy to promote corn and soybean as low-cost um, yeah. uh, means for supporting kind of a, a hungry planet. Um, and... Uh, And so overnight, the Minnesota farms went from being flax to corn and soybean. Mm -hmm. Now, no one thought of the nutritional impact upon that. So the nutritional impact was all of a sudden we're getting a lot of omega-6 fatty acids and very little omega-3s. And so where we previously had a nice teeter-totter balance, or ideally we would, the U.S. food supply went very much high omega-6s, very low omega-3s. Now, no one has really addressed this at a policy level, at a national level. There are a lot of people who are deeply concerned about this. Mm. And here's what people need to know. Essential fatty acids mean we have to eat them. We can't make them. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they're not in our diet, we're just out of luck. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if we have a high um, processed food diet, we're really out of luck. <laughs> yeah. Processed foods tend to be very high in omega-6s, some of which are good. Um, so like um, uh, something called DGLA, which uh, can be made from uh, supplementation with like uh, evening primrose oil, can be very helpful with menstrual concerns and very helpful uh, for other anti-inflammatory activities. But I like measuring it. I don't like just giving it. Right. And this is where people get in trouble. They say, oh, I hear omega-3s are good. Um, I'm going to take four grams a day or seven grams a day forever and ever and ever. And they come into my clinic, and they have sky-high omega-3 levels and profoundly low omega-6 levels. And they're wondering why they have 36 uh, concerning health uh, 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 symptoms. And it's just like, yeah, you're out of balance. Yeah. And, but the good things that come from healthy omega-6s and from healthy omega-3s are things which help roll back inflammation. Mm-hmm. Right. We call them fun words like resolvents <laughs> or <laughs> protectants or yep. mericins. And those are the true scientific terms. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that plays a big role. So going back into the primary care office, it's just like no one's looking at this. No one's asking about nutrition. Yeah. So if someone comes in, I want to ask about their diet. Oh, you're gluten-free and vegetarian or vegan? Where are you getting your methionine? Mm -hmm. Who's talking about that? No one's talking about that. You know methionine, then you can't make a variety of other really important things like creatine and carnitine and uh, uh, glutathione and uh, so much more. Oops. Um, so, so So essentially, since these things aren't being taught in medical school right now we're all kind of have to teach ourselves and this is exactly why you guys are here right to to help transform and really empower Mm -hmm. people to to be in position so my little contribution today would be say yeah actually the omega-3s and omega-6s are really important and yes we should ensure that if we're not eating sardines and salmon and uh, walnuts and other things or particularly if we're vegetarian or vegan, you know, we want to make sure that we've got, you know, got good levels of these. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they're measurable. The technology exists. And it's not that expensive. Um, mm-hmm. What's important is can we have a good balance and do we have enough of these so that we can actually, when inflammation uh, is present, we can roll it back or we can keep it kind of, uh, or can keep shift ourselves and I'm doing a, a teeter-totter mm-hmm. off balance here um, saying that you know, if we really have high omega sixes and low long chain omega threes, every little thing come along, it's just going to be 
accentuated, exaggerated, mm -hmm. uh, excessive. Right. And, um, and we have limited ability to turn it off. Yeah. I want like all of our listeners, anybody who's watching this, like the next test you ask for, this omega-3, omega-6 profile. I love this. Yeah. Like the more people who know this, it seems like the better, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what happens to the doctor says, I've never heard of these. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But thankfully, that isn't going to be the case. But, yes. but um, oh, we have a prescription for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we can ask We can ask more questions. We're our own best mm -hmm. advocates, right? We like are. we can yeah. ask and be, to be informed that we want to empower people with this information, which is what mm -hmm. we do in all the content yeah. we're aiming to create. Yeah. So the other thing that's very interesting, I need to add, that's very important yeah. and for every reader, every listener to really know about, and that is dental health. Mm. 37 years ago when I started medical school, it was like back then, um, <laughs> the idea of medical health and dental health were two completely separate worlds. Mm -hmm. Now we know, oh my goodness, they are just, they're one and the same. And so paying attention, close attention to dental health is foundational to um, anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. actions. We can have a lot of things uh, stuck in, in things. So, let me share uh, a true story, which is is exceptional in terms of how powerful this can be. Okay. And that is, I was seeing a young person. Anyone younger than me is young, <laughs> but they were they were in their fifties, and they had pretty severe dementia. Hmm. On a on a dementia test that you, the three of us, would score a thirty on, they scored an eighteen on. Hmm. That means they're pretty close to to being in you know, in kind of a care unit. Okay. Um, and they come to me, I do, they're young. And it's just like, this doesn't make any sense. We do the complete workup and don't really find anything. But they have a history of four very old root uh, canals. Mm. And I said, well, um, this can be a driver of things and um, a variety of things. So we do a CT cone beam scan to look for what's called a periapical abscess. That is, a root canal can be actually a little vacuum that nature doesn't like, and bacteria can actually grow and fester in there mm. Mm. And, uh, and send off a variety of toxins and create problems. And it came back as he had four periapical abscesses, mm. one for each root canal. Now, the family is trying to decide, oh, my goodness, this is expensive to take care of. But at the same time, they realize a month in in memory care is real expensive in itself. Right. So they said, okay, we'll go ahead and get these taken care of, not knowing what it would do. I saw him again somewhere like four to six months later, and he's doing a lot better. So we repeat the score, and depending on how you score the test, he came back at a 23 or 24. This is unheard of. This is unbelievable. No one gets better on these tests. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, a little bit here and there, perhaps, or we slow the progression of the test. This is a major reversal. This is someone who can go to dinner parties now. This is not someone who's going yeah. into memory care. And was simply taking care of that. That's an, exa a, you know, an extreme example, but right. the, these micro-inflammatory things in the teeth need to be taken care of. We really do need to floss. We do need to <laughs> do these things. Mm -hmm. They really are important. Yep. Our dentist can be our best friend for an anti-inflammatory uh, kind of self-care. I love that. We have a couple articles actually ab about this exactly with the, what what your mouth is trying to tell you, and a lot of the things mm. that we covered were about inflammation and then other like more natural some dental care pieces as well. Because why like the mouth is kind of a symbol. It can be a symbol of like the health of your body, right? Or can influence yes. it. Yes. So it's a, it's kind of a window to things. Yes. So the connection between um, dental health and Cardiac health, mm -hmm. a driver of cardiac inflammation, which drives atherosclerosis, which drives heart attacks and strokes. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Driver of neuroinflammation, very positive connections with other things. Who knows what else is going to be discovered? But it's very clear we need to take good care of our teeth. Mm -hmm. Well, we covered a lot of inflammation. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Let me stop. Information. We covered a lot <laughs> with that just now. Um, and before we go into our mic drop moment, is there anything else that uh, you want to leave our listeners with before we uh, go into the mic drop? Maybe something will come up. Maybe the mic drop will actually prompt something prompt like something? that. Okay. Okay. We might here come go. back to that, yes. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Mic drop moment. One question, one answer. 20 years ago, everything that you know currently right now, 
you go back 20 years ago, and I even say 22 so we can get to the top of 2000. The information that you know now, if you can take it and apply it from 2000, what would you have implemented that you now see as an area of opportunity that could probably send us into promised lands in this space? Uh, that would be the autonomic nervous system. Okay. Okay, so the autonomic nervous system is everything that our body does that we don't think about. Pupil size, goosebumps, blushing, heart rate, blood pressure, intestinal motility, and so much more. It's all the autonomic, or some people call it the automatic nervous system. What I've learned in the past three months has blown me away. Mm. I truly have had more tears of joy in my office in the last three months than I have in 35 years, uh, th any three-month period in 35 years of seeing patients. And it's all due to paying attention to the autonomic nervous system. And what's important about this mm -hmm. for listeners is our care and attention to one half of the autonomic nervous system, um, which we call the parasympathetic nervous system, this is the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the vagus nerve is what it, uh, attaches our brain to our eyes and sinuses and throat and esophagus and lungs and heart and stomach and gallbladder and, and pancreas and spleen and intestines and ovaries and testes and, and more. And it's operating behind the scenes. It's like, it's like uh, the optimal, uh, kind of like it's the, it's the ultimate in non-artificial intelligence. It's right. like it's got its own mm -hmm. algorithms and it's running uh, things. Attentiveness to this has completely blown me away in terms of what it means for all kinds of symptoms that people experience. And what's how it's related to inflammation is that when we pay attention to the vagus nerve in our body and activate the vagus nerve and their exercises, breathing exercises mm -hmm. and gargling and, and uh, chanting and, and and uh, meditating and Tai Chi and Qigong and so many things like that. When we pay attention to our vagus nerve and make sure that it is in a nice teeter-totter balance with the other half of the sympathetic nervous system, which we consider kind of the get up and go, the fight or flight, the yep. adrenaline system, um, then we activate something called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. Mm. Now, the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway was only described about 20 years ago. Hmm. So it's new, and most people have never heard of it. But, um, but all the vagus nerve activities that you guys have described in the podcast and in the magazine and elsewhere, all these activities support the anti-inflammatory actions in hmm. our body. Yep. So if we are actually, if we're in constantly in a fight or flight state, and as opposed to a rest and digest state, um, then we tend to be more pro-inflammatory mm. just from that. And that is we don't, we're not giving time for the other half of the teeter-totter yep. to activate this whole other pathway. And this whole other pathway is going to turn out to be really profound. Mm. The receptor for this pathway is, is where viruses can enter our body, including the, oh, our also favorite COVID virus, mm -hmm. for example. Um, oh, wait a second, what's going on here? <laughs> uh, this is, so this is, uh, so there's a lot to that. So my, myself 20 years ago, I would say, pay attention to, the, to this autonomic nervous system. It's going to change the world. And again, it supports everything that that you guys feel so passionate about, about self-care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is in our power. And now we have the, thanks to NASA, thanks to the astronaut program, who knew when astronauts go into space for two days or more, they come back to Earth and the autonomic nervous system can be in complete disarray. So NASA's taken a lot of interest in this. Oh, so there are now ways of assessing this, now ways of addressing this. It's been phenomenal. Mm. And um, 
And I see this as being a huge new frontier in medicine. Mm. So myself, 20 years from now, I, I hope I'm still practicing. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. I, th- I figured I'm, I figured I'd work till I'm 81. So and we'll, we'll talk about retirement then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you got some time. <laughs> yeah. I got, well, I figured by then I'll finally understand medicine. Oh, <laughs> so, I'm sure. Yes, Amazing. but this has been a whole a whole new area, That's and awesome. so. I think that you'll be hearing more about it, seeing more about it, yep. more insights, and more things about what we can do for ourselves, mm-hmm. that true primary care that is so important. Yeah. And, oh, it's anti-inflammatory and pro-health. I love that. It's so great. So great. Well, Dr. Plotnikoff, thank you so much for taking time to come and spend time with us in the studio today. I cannot wait for this to drop for our listeners and viewers. Nice. And, oh, Okay, we'll share okay. the feedback with you. Okay. We get it. They're going right. to be excited. So, well, okay. so to learn more about you, they can find your work at Minnesota Personalized Medicine, your website for that. Um, we'll link to that, mnpersonalizedmedicine.com. They can search you out on LinkedIn as well. Anywhere else they can find you? Those are two primary. Uh, I suppose if you Google me, you find something. I haven't Uh-oh. done that for a while, but who knows what you're going to find. <laughs> who so. knows what you're going to find? Well, we'll make sure to include those links in our show notes okay. so people can connect with okay. you if they need to. So cool. thank you again. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. Thank you thank both. You so this, much, is, yeah. this has been great fun, and That's I really awesome. appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate you. Yeah.